uh, for inviting me as well and Anush for <laughs> forwarding the request. So I, uh, are they here? Probably. <clears throat> anyway, so, <clears throat> Uh, so today I'm going to talk about one of our uh, recent uh, work uh, that we just started uh, a program kind of thing. And then uh, just uh, initial uh, stuff that we have, I just want to mention that. So uh, this work is based, based uh, on this uh, thing, this archive number and uh, with uh, Tanya Mundal. Uh, she is also a postdoc at uh, WITS now. And uh, also I will, at the very end, uh, I will just glimpse over some very recent results that we have, uh, that is with uh, Tanya and uh, Alessio. <clears throat> and so he's a faculty in MTP for me. So um, uh, let me start. Before starting, so I thought that probably there will be some uh, students and PhDs as well. So um, just to um, familiarize everything. So uh, the supergravity, one can think of supergravity as some low energy limit of uh, super string theory or M theory or any other uh, candidate of uh, quantum theory of gravity. Now, if you one uh, neglects the higher curvature effects, this uh, gravity part of the theory, the highest theory that uh, reduces to the Einstein-Hilbert action that coupled with certain number of matter fields and uh, gauge fields and all those, uh, depending on from which theory you are coming from. Typically, these fields are uh, named as moduli scalars. They can be fermions, gauge fields, and gravitons, gravity nodes. So, uh, and uh, no, the, the, the thing that mainly I will focus on is basically the rise the nodes from black hole that probably all of you know. So, <laughs> I'll not go into details of that. Good. So in this talk, basically I'll start with a prologue, which is already done. There will be an epilogue as well, but I forgot to write it here. And then uh, we'll start with just uh, smaller stuff that uh, what uh, external black holes and some comments on what are attractors. Uh, I will not go into the details of attractor mechanism and all, but just some comments on attractors. Then I will <laughs> describe the simplified state setup that we initiated our work with. It's a very simple setup that I just described. Then of course, go into the, uh, the first part of this talk, which is the Freudenthal duality, mm, uh, and define it and uh, you'll understand what is, uh, what's that actually. Then I will just uh, glance over uh, near extremality and how this near extremal entropies can be uh, computed through JT gravity kind of setup and do the same uh, for our simplified setup as well. Uh, compute the entropies through uh, JT gravities, uh, and then comment on the status of a duality and what exactly we are uh, doing and right now, some good result, I would say. Uh, still some checks are remaining, but some good results. Good. <clears throat> and in the meantime, if something, I mean, I wrote the slides in a hurry, so if something missing, some plus minus signs, please just bug me whenever you want. Okay, that's fine. Okay, so, uh, these are the things that you guys already uh, probably know that uh, we are uh, this extremal black holes have some uh, weird properties in some sense because normally uh, it does not have uh, a temperature temperature goes to zero uh, but still there is thermodynamics you can talk about um, entropies and even that's the way you define uh, what is that temperature zero entropy so uh, this one uh, this this metric that i wrote here this is the standard rise the nodes from black hole, which is basically a black hole which have mass M as well as some charge Q for whatever reasons. <laughs> now, if you do then uh, uh, analysis of these things, uh, of this thing, you can set this thing to be zero as your um, uh, horizon. And then all those things you can calculate, you will see that you have two horizons. That's also probably you guys know. And then uh, the temperature is given by this thing, m square minus q square, and all those things. So you see that for a very sane uh, limit on temperature to be real, you would of course say that, okay, my mass have to be greater than equal to greater than or equal to uh, the charge. And uh, the extremal limit is basically saturating the bound when you said mass equal to the charge. And in this case, uh, these two horizons, as you can see here, yeah, these two horizons will coincide and you will only have one horizon, r plus equal to r minus, okay? Uh, so in the um, 
isotropic coordinates so here don't confuse with uh, this notations this r and this r this r is different because at that r you have uh, your um, uh, horizon was at some 2gm or something and here r equal to 0 is your horizon so these are called the isotropic coordinates so in isotropic coordinate the same thing same metric you can write it like this okay and then if you just do a near horizon geometry you see that you will have this kind of structure now here you see this is like a you have uh, this whole geometry is kind of factorized uh, you see a ads2 part and of course you also see a uh, two sphere because d omega is kind of a solid angle so this two sphere has a uh, radius of q so in some sense you can think of this geometry as something like this uh, sorry mm -hmm something like this that as you go on going towards the uh, horizon your uh, this radius is basically fixing to be q and this infinite through okay good uh, that's your extremal thing and that's what we will need as well that all the for every extremal black holes that uh, you will have the near horizon geometry is always ads2 cross some sn so for example if you are in d dimensional space time your geometry would be ads2 near horizon geometry would be kind of ads2 from s this d minus 2 good <clears throat> so uh, uh, as 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 you guys already know in some sense that uh, in 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 standard um, uh, i mean in the in the gr you normally solve uh, killing vector equations to get your uh, symmetries and all those things. So here, sorry, I, I, uh, are you sure that your the plus two is correct in the exponent? Sorry, I cannot hear you. So are you sure you have, you seem to have got the two and the minus two in the wrong places? Is that which correct? one? In the what factors? Ah uh, yes, which uh, oh the two and minus two? Yeah. So with uh, what you have written, the next line yeah. does not follow. Right, right, right. Yeah. Correct. Okay. Thanks, thanks, thanks. Thanks. Yeah. Correct. Thanks. Thanks for pointing. Good. So, anyways, yeah. So, uh, but this this one is correct. So, sorry for the misread. Uh, so, in uh, in 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 super symmetric scenarios, you will normally solve uh, killing uh, spinner equations. And that will take you typically uh, the RN uh, black hole that we have that we described above. Now, uh, the extremal situation, uh, normally, as you have seen that extremal situation or your uh, black hole uh, um, horizon is basically uh, explained in terms of the chart. So here also for extremal situation, you would assume that uh, even though we are not including spin, but uh, your extremal uh, solution for the black hole, your extremal black hole entropy is basically defined through uh, entropy uh, charges and uh, um, uh, char basically uh, basically all those things are uh, in charges in our entries. We haven't considered the uh, rotating things yet. Okay, so uh, in, in principle- Again, said, uh, are you really sure you want to say that entropy appears in the, in the uh, in the horizon relation between uh, charges and spin yes because in 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 uh, your uh, when, when you will calculate uh, I mean that's that's what the attractor geometry tells you right that your entropy is fixed in terms of uh, your uh, charges in the black hole right i mean entropy is always fixed in terms of the extensive quantities there is nothing special right. extreme Right, right. So here the point is that here, if you are coming out, coming from a let's say uh, type two string theory or something, you have modular scalar fields. I just want to mention that. So you have modular scalar fields and all those things. So and that those scalar fields can have any values that they can pick at the uh, boundary, right? So in principle, if you just look at it, just coming out of some um, uh, higher dimensional theory, uh, assume that uh, I mean, you at first glance it would seem that. Uh, that your uh, black hole entropy uh, or the values of the entropy may might depend on the scalar values at the uh, at the boundary as well, but that's where the attractor mechanism comes in. But why why should I imagine something like that? So are the scalar values at the boundary extensive properties? In thermodynamics, entropy will be a function of the extensive properties of the right, state. right, excellent, good. So, so your no, no here theorem actually guarantees that that you will not have anything like that. 
at least because uh, any essentially we are in a uh, flat uh, asymptotically flat space time so in principle you uh, assume that your black holes should not have uh, that uh, dependence in, uh, in 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 entropy uh, the um, uh, scalar values at infinity but uh, when actually we are doing the, uh, I mean, there can be other effects as well, which I'm not uh, considering here, because let's say you want to probe uh, smaller black holes or something, then it would be your essential that you also consider your hard uh, curvature things and the full action and all those things. Attractive mechanism will also help you in avoiding that part as well. So attractive mechanism just tells you that all the, uh, uh, in some sense, uh, that all the um, uh, scalar values that you can fix at the boundary, that all flows to the same point, same value. Okay. Right. Okay. So in, in that sense, that's why I, I just wanted to mention that uh, their entropy is, uh, is like that. For example, if I if you have a as a you you, you can have black hole. I mean, hairy black holes kind of situation, right? In a, a ADS, not in a flat asymptotically flat space time. You can still have some uh, hairy black hole kind of solutions. So, in 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 some some sense, uh, uh, any any black hole, as you are saying, that you are, you would also always assume black hole would be something uh, defined by only mass charges and all things that you can see from the uh, extensive things. Now, um, uh, there there are hairy black hole solutions, and uh, this attractor mechanism in Please go ahead. Go ahead. Also, yeah. Yeah. Okay, so anyway, so attractive mechanism I have to anyway tell, uh, talk about. So attractive mechanism not only so all the here we are considering asymptotically flat black hole, but uh, attractive mechanism also hold for asymptotically ADS black hole as well. Uh, but yeah, that's not what uh, we will uh, consider right now. And also one more thing about the attractive mechanism is that uh, it's a it's a um, advantage on n equal to two and uh, dimension four. Uh, that uh, what you can do is you can dimensionally reduce the four dimensional supergravity action to a single dimension. And what uh, you have is a effective Lagrangian kind of thing. And that effective Lagrangian when you, uh, it's like a, some particles or something moving in some potential kind of situation. And there, uh, the, the uh, finding the minima of uh, the scalars, modular scalars that you will have in the theory uh, becomes very simple. And it's the standard, <coughs> standard attractive solution that you have for differential equation that comes out very naturally. Anyway, so I don't want to go to the attractor in details. So here the setup, that's, this is the uh, kind of thing that we'll deal with. So, uh, so basically uh, we will only consider the bosonic part of it. And uh, we consider n equal to two supergravity action with uh, n number of um, coupled with n number of vector multipliers. This n can be anything. Uh, we haven't, uh, I mean, there's no bound on that. So uh, this HAB just to be the uh, clear about the notations. So this R is basically coming out of this G of G mu nu, which is the space time metric. And uh, this HAB are your uh, modular space metrics. This XA, and XB that uh, you can see here, those are the scalars that I was actually now talking about. So you can see that from the from the action, you could you can see that um, I mean, in some sense, your uh, entropy is like log Z. So you would assume that if action some X something says sitting here, so my entropy may also depend on X, the values of X, and it it can show that it will uh, it will not. <clears throat> in any case. So uh, this F, this curly F that you have, those are uh, corresponding basically the field strength of some uh, one form A lambda. And this mu and uh, nu, everything is basically fixed from uh, which Calabiao contraction you are coming from. So in this case, what we are uh, thinking is a n equal to two supergravity, which is coming out of a uh, type two A string theory. So you have a 10 D type two A string theory, you compactify it uh, on some uh, scale, some Calabiao manifold. And uh, after compactifying that in 4D, this is the bosonic part of the action uh, that uh, I've written down. So this mu and nu or this coupling constant, this mu nu uh, couplings are basically also fixed by from which theory are coming down to. So everything is fixed, mu, nu, and everything is fixed through this hmm, uh, something called this prepotential F. 
and this p potential f also depends on this um, values of x a x b x c where this x's are defined like this and this x's are your uh, um, uh, this modular scalar so you see everything is depend on what is the value of the modular scalar this p potential as well <laughs> okay so um, as uh, probably you guys know, so this scalar potential is basically uh, this thing. Uh, if scalar potential is uh, K, so basically you see this HAV bar, everything is uh, completely fixed. And here you see there's a mix matching number in some sense, just this lambda runs from zero to N, A from one to N. So you can, what you can do is that you can just introduce one uh, new thing and uh, you, did, you can use some symmetries which guarantees that you can set any value to x0 and this x0 uh, normally you choose I mean at least here we chose is x0 to so be uh, one so if you do that mm, your life gets more simplified and you will end up with a uh, killer potential which simply looks like this okay and uh, also as I said this uh, gauge coupling constant mu and nu that you have those are also fixed and uh, they are fixed through fixed through this relation, where you see this n is also depending on uh, basically your uh, p potential again. So everything is fixed. <laughs> so here we'll I mean these calculations are complicated. So what we do we'll keep on simplifying our life uh, so much so that it's a very <laughs> simple theorem at the end of the day. So we, uh, we'll first consider n equal to three, which it's dubbed as the n equal to three theory that we'll use is dubbed as the STU model. So STU, STU model, you can uh, inter, interpret that STU model as something that coming out of type two strings compactify on a six to T six and uh, that factor has <coughs> three T twos. Now uh, in type two A, uh, you have, I mean, at least the stable configurations that you have for deep brains are uh, even Sorry. dimensional. You have. Isn't yes. uh, a six torus always T2 times T2 times T2? Yes, yes. So here I'm saying that here you can have, could have any CY3 for STU, you are just doing that. So the non triviality on these things will come only through how. Is a six torus different from three, two tori? Which one? Sorry. Is a six torus different? From three two tori. Three two tori. Okay, three T six. How is T six different from T two cross T two cross T two? Are they the same? Uh, T six torus and T two cross T two uh, cross T two. They are different. They are different in the same way that T T six can be trivially uh, not trivially. There can be some complex structure uh, Google calculations, but other than that, you can uh, factorize it as T two cross T two cross T two. Uh, okay. Yeah. So uh, how how your uh, D zero uh, I mean this D, uh, D brains how wrap uh, how they are they wrap around this T two uh, different T twos different cycles of T two. That determines that you have uh, how many magnetic and electric charge that you can have. And it's at least in this case, you can see that you have four magnetic and four electric charge. So <clears throat> mostly the name ST and U come because of uh, this relation. Mm, uh, this relation that you can set, you have three complex uh, scalars, you're fixing them as ST and U. And uh, you can see that your F, uh, the free potential gets simplified as well. You'll get x1, x2, x3, x0, and also this uh, DABC uh, thing that we have defined earlier that just get <laughs> one by six value. That's all. So now uh, this x says that you have this s uh, x1, x2, x3 that can still have uh, that, that that may still have uh, that may still take different values at the boundary and the horizon. Although there is an attractor mechanism which guarantees that whatever value is set at the boundary, horizon value is fixed. We are also considering a double extremal black hole, which is basically defined as uh, where uh, all the uh, the scalar field is basically constant through over through over the I mean, the full moduli space. The, so there is no change in the um, uh, in the in the, the moduli scalar. It's the same value all over the place. This is a very simplified situation now. Good. So in this situation. Uh, uh, even without the uh, double extremal uh, black hole scenario that you can consider. What you can have is that uh, due to this 
paper and say old paper 1997. So here you can see that uh, these are the values that you can get. So X1, X2s are like uh, your real part and imaginary part of uh, the complex scalars. Sorry, so sorry, sorry, I'm getting a little bit lost. So yeah. uh, in the, the previous slide, yes, you now take this pre-potential and right. from this pre-potential, you go back and you substitute this into that action that you showed. Right. And you get some bunch of fields and you are now solving that action to find a solution, right? Uh, I, I can I, I am solving the uh, uh, action, but what I'm doing is uh, at first going to a one-dimensional scenario uh, by dimensionally reducing them, and then I'll get a effective uh, potential. That's what I'm solving. And okay. if you solve that, you will get this one. These are the results. I mean, that's the result that uh, you can uh, see. But uh, uh, for, for one, so one solving... in terms of the one-dimensional system, yes. what is this S? Is S the on-shell action? Right. Is is the for the for the one-dimensional system you're asking? Is it? Uh, is it the on-shell yes. action? Yes. You can you can calculate it like that. Yes. It's that. No, no, no. I, do, I don't want to calculate. You see, that. you what see that you're if you have this, uh, if you solve for this some V, you will get some field. I'm not sure how to uh, exact thing, but you will get some V black hole kind of solution situation, and other you will have different fields here, uh, some uh, uh, trivial thing. Then you can solve this V black hole uh, for v different values of your moduli fields. You see that there's a minimum that this VVH can have, then at the, at the minimum, you just calculate the action. That would give you- Now, what has uh, this uh, action got to do with entropy? Which, uh, this action, you can just take log Z, right? I, I can take log Z of the action of a simple harmonic oscillator. No one is going to tell you that that is entropy. Supposing oh, you take so, the on-shell action so, of a simple yeah. harmonic oscillator. Right, right. You yes. can take log, no? Right. right. Why is that so, so, right. So, so in 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 uh, normal uh, in in a situation like that, you what you is, use is normally that in uh, that uh, near horizon limit, you also have a uh, ADS two. You you have a CFT, right? So you can use uh, your Cardi formulas and all to calculate to see that this is exactly the entropy that you can get. This uh, whatever result that will that you will get. Okay. That would also coming out of the microscope, uh, I mean, microscopic degrees of freedom that you can count uh, through the um, uh, this thing, uh, Cardi formula as well. So from that way, you will be sure that this is the entropy. Okay. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> so um, uh, so these are the. Uh, uh, these are the uh, uh, attractor solutions that you can get x1, x2s, and uh, your entropy that uh, I mean, entropy and see this this thing, this x1, x2s also depend on the value of entropy. Uh, so, if you do a, uh, I mean, uh, to uh, solve it out, what you can do is uh, uh, consider a ansatz for x tilde i uh, that how it should look like, and then uh, just putting back what you can calculate is that extremal entropy. In this case, so extremal entropy is just uh, so p's and q's are integers, is it? Yes, yes. Here p's and q's are integers. So these are like your charges. For example, uh, if you think about the so, q so zero, you're saying that the are minima of the potential at the minima of the potential, mm -hmm. uh, the solutions for x's are always given in terms of some such combinations of integers, is it? Exactly. Yes. So now that is a rather surprising potential, isn't it? Yes. Yes, exactly. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, uh, I mean, in some sense, it's striking that you would get that. And that's for a different wide class of solutions, um, black holes, I mean, you can do that actually. Uh, so S2 is just a simple uh, part of it. So you can uh, do it in many possible ways. So anyway, so uh, pr pr probably we can comment on that afterwards. So um, this is the entropy that you will get. And as I pointed out, so everything is basically defined in terms of in principle integers because uh, this P0, Q0, Q0. So, so okay, just I should also mention this uh, P, Q0, P0, these are like uh, the D brain charges. So in type 2A, your D0 is basically electric brain. So that's why uh, it has Q0. Then 
um, uh, your D2 is uh, similarly, uh, you can see your D2 would be another electric one. You'll get okay. it. So uh, here, I am, I am still quite puzzled yes, by this. Yes, yes, In sure, classical sure. mechanics, when we find mm -hmm. the solution, we do not get any kind of quantization, right? Like, for example, the electric charge yes. can be any real number. The magnetic exactly. charges also, if at all they are there, the currents can be any real numbers. Right. Right. You really have to use some quantum mechanics to arrive at quantization. To arrive at it, yes. So yes. then is it correct to say that the classical solution actually is giving you integers? Ah, so it, it actually ah, so it, it actually does in some sense because you see, I mean, when you are actually solving this one, this thing, so you have an equation of motion for your charges, right? Also the gauge came you and all. So there actually you are in some sense putting the answer that you know your you know this f uh, rt kind of thing you say that this is like u by r square uh, sorry uh, you can't do that. So i thought you're in one dimension so what is f r oh no what i'm saying is not not in one dimension but okay, let me just uh, that's the uh, point now so that's my question you're not in four dimension so you can't use this equation so what is the equation that you are going to use in order to say that q must be an integer Oh, so, so here, uh, I mean, uh, this V black hole that you will effectively get in that, in there, you cannot have any uh, comment on what can be your P and Q. This is only in the foresight that you want to match it with a uh, calculation from the higher dimension. Then only you will say that your P and Q are basically integers. So as they are saying that if you go to one dimension, there is nothing uh, that can save you from uh, having uh, you know, non non integer p and q. That's true, but in the these are this one dimensional calculation. Uh, if you do, I mean, these are this have come a bit later on. Uh, so uh, the entropy calculation that you can uh, do, uh, you, you don't always need to go to one dimension. From there, you can see that um, uh, you uh, in four dimension that these are like integers. These q's and p's are charges actually. Okay. So in one dimension, you don't have that. So, uh, you don't have that uh, information once you go to one dimension. Okay. 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 Or else, what, this one-dimensional thing. Uh, let me finish this up. Then we can uh, discuss. I will. I will tell you what exactly it is. I just uh, uh, finish. Let me just finish with this thing. Then we can discuss the one dimension and figure out uh, what the mismatch is happening. Okay. Good. <clears throat> so. Uh, okay, so so uh, here, as you pointed out, uh, so these are uh, this is your uh, uh, this is your for STU, uh, this is your entropy, and uh, once you have entropy, then the next thing is you're looking for if, if there is any symmetries or something like that. Of course, there is a U duality symmetry that sorry, sorry for my voice, <clears throat> it's not Britannic. So. <clears throat> Uh, that there's there's already a u duality symmetry that you know that is a mm. continuous symmetry. So, uh, but uh, Freudenthal symmetry is basically a uh, discrete symmetry, at least the way I will uh, put it here. So, this duality is basically a uh, nonlinear anti-involutive in a sense because this will take you here. So, what this tells you is that uh, you have this. Uh, charges, so P's and Q's. P are your magnetic charges and Q are your uh, electric charges. So what does it tell you that if, if you change your Q hat, Q hat is basically the new set of charges that you will have. If you define your new set of charges in terms of the old set of charges in this way, uh, this jugglery, this, this S is the entropy. If you do that, then you can see that uh, your entropy remains same. That's uh, this is, and of course, you can see. I mean, at least understand from this equation, this is a very nonlinear transformation. If you take any derivative over, let's say, small q a or small p a, you can understand uh, it's a very nonlinear uh, change. But even under this not uh, nonlinear change, what you can see is that uh, this entropy remains exactly the same. Of course, the form would remain the same because it's just a different theory with different values for p and q. Uh, but the value of the entropy, I mean, the numerical value of the entropy, that's also remains the same under this particular transformation, okay? Uh, where, of course, you have a choice. This omega I men have to uh, make sure you have to uh, follow these uh, relations. And uh, here we are basically considering 
uh, omega as this form. There are other forms in some uh, scenarios, but as long as uh, this thing holds, it's fine, whatever omega you are taking. Whatever omega you are taking here, as long as they are uh, following this tool, you can of course get a charge Q hat uh, where uh, your entropy is same. So essentially what you can do is that by dualizing, you have a, a D0, D2, D4, D6 system. And you're saying that, okay, I will also have another D0, D2, D4, D6 system, which is dual to this one. But the only invariant things are uh, the entropy. Uh, other things, uh, other values, in fact, uh, may, may change. Uh, other, uh, because your duality uh, remains a lot of things, uh, makes a, a lot of uh, invariants. Here you will not see those invariants. These are, this is not uh, a U duality invariant, okay? So that's a, that's a symmetry. So it's like a, if you have, in some sense, it's, it's basically doing a microscopic count of a counting down uh, count of thing, kind of thing. So what you are saying is essentially you have two systems who have equal entropy, uh, but their charges are completely different and uh, they, they, they are differing by this uh, relation. Okay? So for this so, compactification, there is a U-duality group as well, right? Yes, so that's also the, uh, So under U-duality, does the entropy remain the same? Yes, here yes, in this case. Yes, but still this is not so the U-duality. U-duality is a linear mapping among the charges. Yeah, exactly, exactly. This is a highly nonlinear mapping, exactly, yes. But also I have to say that this is a very discrete uh, set of things because you see Q only goes to a particular value. Uh, it's not a very generic transformation that you can say. Sure. Hmm. So it's a very discrete, very nonlinear transformation, but still it gives you uh, symmetry. <clears throat> so just a bit of a hint, I mean, what might connect to, but because as uh, what I was asking the question that I mean, uh, the, the, the integer things and how those uh, kind of, why is it uh, the entropy and all. So there's a, they have very beautiful connections with dynamical systems and number theory and all those things that we can, uh, that, that's a very good literature aside in attractor mechanism and all. So uh, apart from that, this Freud and duality in some sense giving it a, uh, further connection, giving a further connection with uh, your, uh, with, with uh, I would say mathematics side, uh, at least at this point. So for the triple system is something that uh, people have worked on, mathematicians have worked on, and while uh, why they are working on, they wanted to uh, get, uh, work on some, ex uh, some exceptional Lie algebras and uh, um, uh, they uh, stumbled upon this uh, Freudental uh, triple system and um, uh, all those things. I will not go into the definition, but we can discuss afterwards the definition and what's meaning of it. But you see then this, this symmetry that actually goes in um, uh, the black hole is as early as 2009, people have shown it that if you have this uh, dionic uh, charges of the black hole, this charges itself uh, the symplectic manifold of charges itself have a Freudian triple system kind of structure hidden in, in them. And um, that gives you an extra symmetry that you are not hoping for in some sense, <laughs> okay? So, uh, as, uh, uh, so, so, so uh, this F duality is, uh, although I'm just talking about STU black holes and all those things as what I was asking that uh, this entropy for U duality for other things and all. So this is only a simple part that I'm talking about, but Freudental duality holds for everyone. Uh, the caveats are, uh, Friday they hold for any n, n greater than two as well, greater than equal to two. So n equal to eight supergravity also you will see fundamental duality. There are papers and uh, literature on that. Uh, but the uh, only caveat being that it's a discrete transformation. People have tried to get a um, uh, continuous transformation of fundamental duality. One of our goal is also that. Haven't been very successful, I would say. And uh, this uh, Freudental duality also have uh, some other connections with uh, multi-centered um, uh, black holes as well. Uh, there also you can see the same symmetry. Uh, so it's, a, it's kind of a very robust symmetry that black holes, I mean, at least uh, in this part, I mean, the, the way people have seen it in supersymmetric extremal black holes only, they have seen this Freudental symmetry, okay? So now our goal is basically to see how far we can go with this kind of symmetry, how far this remnant of symmetry remains, even if, if you go to uh, uh, non-extremal limit, or if there is a symmetry, 
if, if this symmetry totally breaks or not when you have a non-extable situation. So problems are, you see that you know, this fundamental duality and all those things are only defined when you have a supersymmetric theory. So they are they have attractor mechanism as well as you have supersymmetries, which are, which are further fixing your theory. So for non-supersymmetric theories, there's no fundamental duality that has been seen anywhere. So for non-supersymmetric theories, it can be two types, right? I and mean, you can have extremal non-supersymmetric and uh, of course, non-extremal is non-supersymmetric anyway. So even for uh, extremal uh, non-supersymmetric solutions, uh, there's no hardcore definition of uh, fundamental dualities. Uh, so one of our goal is basically to get a, a this I mean the, at least see if something some this kind of symmetry can uh, also arise in uh, in non uh, extremal situations. So before going into non extremal situation, uh, we thought that uh, this might be working. That let's go to near extremal situation, right? and and near extremal situation. Let's see uh, what the things are happening. So. Uh, as the scalar field that I was, I was talking about that in attractor mechanism, your scalar field, whatever the boundary value that you set, uh, difference, they, they operate some differential equations such that they always flow to the same point at the, at the horizon. So in some sense, horizon is some special, very special for them, at least the scalar fields. So uh, in, in, in some way you can think of it is that if you have an extremal situation, then your um, scalar field, they basically forget about what happened. I mean, all the, the, the term is that they loses all the memory of what happened at the boundary uh, while, when they're coming to the horizon. Uh, but uh, in, in, in non-extremal cases, what happens is there is no uh, attractor mechanism. I mean, you can have the same, essentially the same equation of equations, you can solve them, but it's not like that if, if you set different values at the boundary, they will, uh, the, the horizon values would be completely different. I mean, they can be completely different. So there is some uh, sort of relation that could have uh, been uh, with the, uh, what is the boundary values. Uh, so here, uh, our first target was to let's uh, uh, calculate these things for a start with a very known system where we know all about the fundamental duality, how they co combine, I mean, connects and all. Then just go a bit away and talk about um, uh, what's happening at the near extremal limit. And let's just see what's the statements. So to go there, uh, a standard technique that has been developed in recent years, it's basically um, uh, a JT gravity kind of setup. So if you want to calculate, <coughs> <coughs> sorry, <coughs> very sorry. So if you want to calculate uh, um, uh, entropy, then uh, one way is to uh, go use this uh, JT gravity uh, kind of uh, kind of setup to get things uh, going. So we'll not go into very much of details. But uh, normally what happens is that if you, uh, if you start with higher dimensional theory, so here there is no boundary on what can be your higher dimensional theory. This is aside of supersymmetry or anything. So whatever your higher dimensional theory is you start from, let's say that your lower dimension, you get ADS2, whatever be it in the higher dimension, even with uh, extra uh, higher curvature terms and all, you will see this kind of form. Mm this kind of form. So this kind, this kind of form in the sense that this term you can see this is like, since you are in 2D, this is a completely, in some ways, I mean, this, has, this is totally fixed. Only in for extra information that you can see from here. So this phi is, I mean, uh, in, if you're coming out of a, let's say you, are, you have a extremal black hole in some higher dimension, you reduce the extremal black hole to uh, at the, at, come to the near horizon, do a dimensional reduction, come to the ADS2 only, so in that case, what you will have is that uh, this phi naught that's sitting here. So this phi naught is basically the area of the extremal black hole in the higher dimension. And this phi is basically, basically phi denotes the deviation from this extremal value. So in extremality, you have phi naught, this phi actually captures what is the deviation from the extremal value. So this is, you can think of it that you start with a phi naught, you add extra perturbation, and that is your phi. So if you do that, you will end up with this kind of uh, setup from a higher dimension. And where phi b is basically the value of phi, uh, this phi at the ADS2 boundary, okay? So if you solve this equations of motion, I mean, just you can calculate what is the equation of motion. This part does not contribute. You can just directly cal calculate from here. And this part is what called the Jacky Teitelbaum, uh, Teitelbaum theory, okay? Only this part. So this is basically a theory of some dilaton. 
but with this exact form. Okay, so if you do that, that's the, I mean, you can have the, uh, just solve it. The general solution normally, uh, it look like this, where I've just uh, wrote it down in both the coordinates, uh, I mean, uh, point cat and Rindler. So it is, uh, these are like that, these are like your Rindler, and this is like your point cat. So here you see that uh, this phi have a solution which looks like this. And of course, at the boundary, uh, at the boundary, this seems to be diverging. Boundary is basically z goes to zero. So you see that this thing start uh, diverging the phi. So what the trick is that you said that, uh, okay, uh, we will introduce a new dimension full coupling, uh, which is the strength of the divergence. So you just said that whatever my boundary value phi b is basically regularized by this uh, epsilon, some value of epsilon. This r is basically put as just a convenience. So you can uh, think of it uh, something else. But uh, the, the claim is that even at the boundary, uh, phi b may diverge, phi r does not. In that sense, this is like a phi denormalized kind of thing that people used to say. That's why the subscript r. So this is the condition that you set at the boundary. Uh, this is the thing happening. And also another just a comment because this u, so here you have, let's say you have t and z coordinates. What you are defining is that at the boundary or z going to uh, epsilon, your boundary coordinates, uh, boundary time coordinate, you are just saying that uh, that's my u, the, my boundary time is u, okay? That's what you're setting. So of course you can be very, uh, uh, you can take different boundary uh, curvatures as well. I mean, it need not be like a very defined uh, u like that. You can have a wiggly, uh, you line as well, any kind of wiggles that you are want to say. In that, in that case, what would happen? Your boundary coordinate, let's say T and uh, rho. So they will be like functions of uh, U. We're just setting that this is the curve over which I'm defining my time to be U. Okay? And that's my uh, boundary. <clears throat> so if you uh, put the equations of motion back in the uh, JT action, this term drops, this term satisfies that, so that goes away. Uh, what you would see is uh, only the uh, given Sokin's terms, I mean, that, that extrinsic curvature term that you have, only that term uh, starts uh, contributing. Uh, other thing drops away as you're putting the equation of motion. So <laughs> you can see that uh, once you uh, do this kind of uh, things, and then you try to calculate your extrinsic curvature, your extrinsic curvature turns out to be this, uh, uh, turns out to be, yeah, turns out to be this in this form. So uh, this is something called a Swarjian derivative. So this derivative is basically with respect to uh, u now, as I have said that t's and rows are now functions of u at the boundary, you are just setting your boundary time to be u. Uh, then this case, uh, this is a Swarjian part. And uh, finally, this epsilon square, you see, it will get, uh, goes away. And what you will get is only uh, this term. Okay, uh, so here uh, there are, uh, I mean, uh, this same term people, uh, probably you guys have already know better than me that uh, this SYK models, and at least in the low energy limit, they also have the same kind of, uh, uh, same kind of action. And uh, for that reason only, people have uh, this JT gravity and SYK connection and all, they all comes through or seeps through this, this Schwarzian action that you are getting <coughs> in this area, okay. So what you do is that uh, to get to the uh, near extremal entropy, uh, what you do is that you now go to your uh, um, uh, Rindler coordinate. So there you have this uh, tau sitting there. Uh, so tau already have a period tau goes to, I mean, it's identification that tau is uh, tau plus two pi. So this action, uh, the solution of this action will always have, uh, will, will, will let you have this kind of term where tau is basically two pi by beta u. So as tau goes to, to if, if tau has to have some periodicity uh, with uh, something, then you see that your u has to have the same periodicity. I mean, it's, you have to be uh, the same with the periodic, uh, you have to be periodic in beta as well, because tau goes to tau plus two pi is a symmetry. So your boundary time itself, you see that there is a periodicity in the in the boundary time. And if you put everything and solve, uh, this is your classical action, this is a Euclidean action. So if you do a um, log z 
uh, thing, you will get that you have a, uh, now you will have a, a two pi square C T term, T where I'm T is defining as one by beta as T. The C is some constant that I haven't just be very judicious about. So, so this all this jugglery, what would give you the, what it let you have is that this part, this initial part, will tell give you the S zero or the leading, uh, I mean the extremal entropy, and this thing would give you the near extremal entropy. So the claim is point is you start with a higher dimensional theory, dimensionally reduce it, you get the background solution. Background solution is basically your uh, your horizon uh, radius and all those things part of your background solution, <laughs> you'll get a JT action kind of thing. And you know this JT action have a connection with uh, this periodicity of the boundary time, which kind of give you a thermal cycle. So for that, you get a two pi square, I mean, the uh, T term is coming. So finally, which leads to the extremal entropy, four pi square CT, sorry. Oh, okay. So, sorry. <laughs> so this four, it's come because I, here I wrote it down 16 pi G and here I just took eight pi G. So that's the two mismatch, but it's fine. So this is the way you normally calculate your uh, near extremal entropy, starting from an extremal uh, situation. So we will follow the same route for our case as well. So initially we start that your our uh, the background solution that I had mentioned in the STU bosonic part of the action. So start with the uh, STU theory uh, with the bosonic part. <laughs> Then take a spherically symmetric answers where G, this G alpha beta tilde can be anything as of now. If you do that, this phi square can also be anything, but as a function of R because I'm reducing it to a theta and phi. So <clears throat> if you do that, uh, I will get, I mean, I'm not go through the calculations. So um, um, that, that big action that I have, this uh, bosonic part that will boil down to here uh, after the dimensional reduction. So here, uh, if, I, if I do this, here we'll get a um, uh, kinetic term kind of thing for the Dilaton action. To get over that, what we do is a while rescaling. So when you do this while rescaling, you will just define phi to some alpha phi kind of thing. If you do that rescaling carefully, what you will see that this uh, delta phi term and the kinetic energy, a kinetic uh, term that you have for the Dilaton that goes away, and uh, you end up with uh, a simple, uh, more simple theory. And uh, as our case, the case that we are considering is also the uh, double extremal situation, but the moduli over the moduli field, the scalar have same value over the full moduli space. So these are, see, these are your uh, moduli space derivative, this alpha and beta. So these terms will also go away for, for our situation, making our life more simple. <clears throat> so we'll get a simple action, this thing. A sink equation of motion, uh, which is this. Now, uh, keeping some subtleties and calculations aside, finally, what you can get is uh, something like this, where I have integrated out all the gauge fields. So here I have this gauge fields, this phi, uh, I mean, the, the MU gauge fields and all. I put back their solution, uh, solution of the equation of motion in the action. And that gives me this thing, this, two-dimensional thing. In this two-dimensional thing, I have already used all the um, uh, solutions of um, uh, equations of, uh, I mean, the, the gauge fields. So P's and Q's, everything is for me now integer. These are the charges, magnetic and electric charges. And chi, we just uh, separated out you know, because just chi looks a bit ugly in here. Other than that, this, uh, this is just uh, something on the function of charges, that's all. So, no, with this, uh, with a little bit jugglery, what you can do is that you can get your equation of motion more uh, simplified. You can make it more simplified. And uh, what you end up with is that since you now have only uh, the dilaton that you have, that's all, nothing else. Everything goes away because scalar fields, we have said that, okay, scalar, scalar fields are like our, our, our um, uh, all of them are basically constant. I know the solution, so put it back. If you do everything, and of course, gauge field you integrate out. Very simple uh, thing that you will end up with. So this is only a 2D dilaton theory. So you started from something, figure, and just thrown away a lot of things here and there because our target is to calculate entropy only. 
So what you will get is a very simple uh, dilaton gravity theory. So now I would not say, I mean, here is, is if you remember the earlier, uh, the, um, the JT gravity action, there is a, R was just, I mean, the, the potential, I mean, the, the first term, it was just R plus two. Here, what you have is a generic potential. I mean, not generic, it's very specific. Uh, but you have a extra potential here. So this is like a some uh, 2D dilaton theory so far. What you can do is that this is simple enough to solve. And you can see that this is a solution of it. This kind of form where you are just setting your phi, the dilaton as R, just R, simply R, and uh, ds square as this and this. This you can uh, see, this is the solution. Only problem is that this term, this C, this curly C, uh, this is an integration Sorry. constant. I am a little bit puzzled by this action. Sure. Why is mm -hmm. there no gradient term on the dilaton? The usual kinetic kind of terms. Right. So that's why we did a while C scaling. So there was a kinetic term. Sorry. Let me just see. Yes. So there was a kinetic term. Is this the term you're talking about? Yeah. So why did it completely disappear? So for example. Oh. The... Go ahead, sir. Yeah. Yeah. That's all. That is the question. Oh, okay. So what you can do is that if you do this while uh, while while rescaling, if you do that that your say that your uh, your g mu nu goes to some alpha uh, g mu nu kind of stuff, so your Ricci scalar also uh, changes uh, under the while rescaling term, okay, yes. and all those things coupled together, you'll see that your uh, this delta phi term, even with the boundaries somewhere in the this case also comes into the picture. Uh, your uh, that term just completely vanishes. You will not have any uh, gradient terms on the delta. If you do a while scaling, okay. I mean that's more, more or less that's the reason. Uh, I mean uh, we have uh, done this while scaling exactly to throw away uh, that extra uh, divergent uh, piece in some way. So that you can see, or I mean we can we can I can show you. I mean uh, in some after some time probably I can just tell you. Uh, if, you, if you are asking that what exactly are the terms that are getting cancelled that I don't remember, <laughs> just to figure oh, out. That is not the question, really. Okay. Yeah. Well, then, then, uh, then probably you can ask afterwards. Let me just uh, finish with it. Then we can uh, go, yeah, ahead. go ahead. Okay. Okay. So yeah. So uh, so this C or this integration constant that's the only thing that is not yet fixed uh, so far. So to do that, what we do is that we do the, uh, a near horizon and far horizon analysis separately. So let's say we have a, our initial starting point. So let's say we have ADS4. So we know that our near horizon is ADS2 cross S2. And uh, the far horizon is basically even, uh, uh, the far horizon uh, geometry does not change whether you are in a uh, extremal or uh, non-extremal situation. So your far horizon geometry, uh, uh, far horizon matrix always uh, reads, uh, uh, far horizon geometry always reads in this form. And in the extremal case that your uh, near horizon limit uh, uh, looks like this. So from comparing this with our solution that we have here, and uh, that claiming that our solution should look like at the uh, some far horizon limit, our solution does should give me this kind of uh, this this if this exact blackening factor. What you can fix is that uh, this integration constant from there. So in taking this far horizon region as kind of my uh, boundary condition. Okay. So if you do that, so now. Uh, at this point, we don't have any unfixed thing. Everything is known in terms of the um, black hole uh, parameters, charges and radius. Everything is known. Good. <clears throat> now, uh, since here we are having a uh, asymptotically flat four-dimensional matrix, so our ADS2 and S2 both have uh, the same, uh, same, uh, same radius. So for our case, this also holds. So L2 is basically here, uh, the ADS2 radius. Uh, so this, in our case, this this condition also holds. <laughs> okay. So uh, putting this uh, this equation that you uh, ds square that we have back to the equation of uh, equations of motion that you have for the dilaton uh, field, it becomes very simple, and you can solve it like this. So this is just another coordinate system that we wrote. So these are the two things that come out of the uh, two equations of motion. Putting back what is my um, exact form of f of r. Okay. <clears throat> 
and uh, what we have checked is that I mean I'm showing that here. Uh, so what we have checked is that if you put back all these things, this r zero square r and everything back into the action, take a um, uh, log. Uh, what you will get is exactly the stu extremal entropy that people have calculated. So this JT it is supposed to produce that and it produces that. All this after all this jugglery, you will get the exactly uh, the stu um, uh, extremal entropy. <laughs> okay. Now, as uh, the standard prescription, uh, what you will do is that you will now mm, mm, that you will now uh, add a perturbation. So, in perturbation, uh, we are taking a very specific form of the perturbation. So, this is uh, in specific in a sense you can take any form, but the solution gets simpler if you take uh, this in this way. Just turn on them a little differently. So, this omega naught is basically coming from here. <coughs> <coughs> So uh, with this perturbation turn on, you put this uh, perturbation back into your uh, action, that effective dilaton action that you have. What you will get is a big uh, equation like this. So in this equation, you see this is the uh, JT part that we have shown earlier that if you are coming from a higher derivative part, a higher derivative action, uh, then you will get some uh, JT gravity kind of action. So this is the JT part. And this is again, uh, this just, this is, I just wrote it like this, but this is essential is just R, uh, the which is uh, scalar for this metric. This is just the rich scalar for this metric, this one. Okay. So um, uh, this thing is basically this term is what, uh, this term is what gives you the uh, extremal entropy. Uh, if you calculate this term, this is what will give you extremal entropy because you see this phi naught, if you put back uh, the solution of phi naught, which is basically minus two r, if you put back, you will see that your u phi naught is zero actually at that extremal point. So that in that way, this is uh, the extremal entropy. This only this part will give you the extremal entropy. And uh, so now, now we just have to calculate uh, what happens with this part to get the near extremal entropy, which will be governed by now this phi, okay, which is the uh, fluctuations over phi naught, I mean the uh, background entropy. So as uh, I'm not going through the calculations again, so you get a JT, go to the Schwarzian, go to the periodicity, everything if you do, what you can get is that you will get a uh, change in uh, the entropy uh, from, uh, you'll get a change in the entropy from your, uh, as, as a, in, in linear in T, uh, which this phi B is essentially the value at the boundary of the ADS2, okay? Now here I should have colored this, three by two as well, I haven't, but I should be. So this two are extra term that I will not, I'm not talking about right now, but just to, I mean, these are the, in some sense, the quantum corrections because uh, this uh, phi, I mean, this fields that you have, there are, there are some uh, path integral measures that you can write over uh, this d phi because of the symmetry, there's some extra term that comes into the picture, which gives you this <laughs> log corrections and all that I'm not going to discuss now. So uh, just aside, what you will get from the JT part is only this thing, okay? Uh, this extra part comes technically out of the JT kind of procedure, but that uh, entails a more uh, rigorous details uh, over what is the measure and all. So let's I'll not go there. So this, so, so far you see that for, we started with STU, went to the near extremal limit. And our whole idea was that probably it cannot be fixed uh, because see attractor mechanism does not hold. So there can be near extremal entropy can depend on uh, what are the values of the scalar here. So something uh, at the horizon, probably it may could have depend on that. So, so far what we have seen is that it only depends on phi b hat. So if you can, if we can calculate the phi b hat, we are done that we'll see that the near extremal black hole entropy is also fixed in terms of the <coughs> already known charges and uh, just additionally temperature, okay? So it, it can be uh, seen that, okay, it's 230. So it can be seen that uh, you're at, at any point, you see, if you remember that our solution was pi equal to R, okay? And at the horizon, what we took is a uh, fluctuation that phi equal to R naught plus some pi, this kind of, fluctuation that we have switched on in the horizon. So, so let's say uh, for, for the timing, you see that there's two regions, you have a uh, uh, kind of near horizon region and there's a far horizon region, let's say these are the your near horizon, this is like your far horizon. What you can consider is let's say there's a boundary between this near horizon and far horizon. And at that boundary, 
uh, some this is some value r equal to let's say this distance is my rb this is like my rb distance so this is some value uh, at, at, at this value I, I know my what should be my phi my, because phi is of course if uh, only phi equal to r and also i know that at the near horizon it should take this value so at the boundary of it at some value uh, what happens is that your phi b which is uh, this thing that you want to fix that looks like this, so R minus R zero, epsilon by R naught. And interestingly, if you go to uh, a global coordinate to, uh, I mean, just switch from uh, global coordinate to, to I mean, linear coordinate again, what you can see is that your, as rho goes to epsilon, this rho T was your, like the linear coordinate. So in that, you can see that as rho goes to epsilon, which is uh, towards the horizon, you will see that your phi b is only r0. r0 is basically the horizon radius again, which is equal to r. So what you can do is with this thing is that you now have a full near extremal entropy in terms of only the black hole charges, I mean, which is already there in S0. And now you have an added term, which only proportional to t, uh, the temperature. Okay. Now it's fine that now one can check that what happens to the Freudental duality in terms of the near extremal entropy. Okay, so uh, as I've said that you there too that there's no attractor mechanism or anything in the so if duality is a very non-trivial question to ask that whether this thing happens. I mean, whole so before you go to this topic, uh, just in the previous computation, sure. sure, yes, the correction went as log. Ah, yes, exactly. So great. So this part, that's why I just marked it as red. I was, I was going to ask what happens in the limit t goes to zero again. Excellent. So yeah, so this is not connected that part. So this is the quantum correction. So that would not go to t equal to zero. Excellent question. So in, in what happens, this log term was kind of really necessary in some sense to uh, get a mass gap, mass gap correction. Normally, when you do this calculation, if you don't have this term, this extra term, what you will see that uh, there is a mass gap between your extremal and non-extremal case. So it's not like uh, there, is the, there can be a Hawking radiation for some temperature. There will be some temperature that you can show where there will be no Hawking temperature, uh, Hawking radiation. So this extra term, this three by two log, that actually comes from the measure uh, that the phi have. So phi have, a, 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 I mean, a, a, a integral d phi kind of measure still remaining that I haven't included here. Uh, that's basically it still have some SL2C kind of uh, the, uh, measure uh, sitting here. So that factors come into the picture and you will get this log factor. And that actually was correct. I mean, at t goes to zero, it's not connected piece in some sense. So, so that's why when you just say that I'm doing a perturbation just away from the uh, uh, t equal to zero limit, the connected piece is only this part. I mean, the, the, the linear in T part. The log part is coming due to a completely different effect. Since the results are known, I just put it here. Okay. So, but that this is a beautiful result in some sense because that tells you that there is a, uh, I mean, it talks about the mass gap things that it, it shows that this log T inside is like it's a three by two log KT kind of thing. So it basically tells you that for any energy, uh, actually black hole can radiate any non-zero energy. Initially, that was not the case. The very recent result in some way. Okay, <clears throat> but that comes from the, uh, the quantum corrections. I will not uh, uh, not uh, put it in here. So anyway, so here also uh, one can. I mean, I'm saving some calculations, not showing it, but one can check that. Okay, let's replace this S uh, that uh, we have. Uh, so this is like kind of you think of this S as I'm generating the Freudental duality. So any Q hat, you just replace del S del Q, right? In some some way. So. <clears throat> What we have seen is that, keeping all calculations uh, thrown away. So what we have seen is that uh, if duality it continues to hold when the transformation is generated by extremal entropy, though it does not hold when the transformation is generated by near extremal. So even if, if, if you have this formula where your S is, let's say S is, is zero, which is the extremal entropy, you'll see that you'll still have fundamental duality even for neural extremal system. In the, for near extremal system as well, your duality holds in that that sense, but the uh, the definition of duality that we want to have or uh, something that uh, I mean there are other motivations, but uh, mathematical motivations, but uh, that one want to have is that yeah I will I will, I will just replace this S 
with some S uh, near HTML and see whether that uh, the Freudian duality holds or not. And it turns out that if you do that uh, jugglery, then it does not hold. So Freudian duality begs. If you do that, uh, generate it through the near HTML um, uh, entropy, okay? But now the question that arises is that, can we fix that? I mean, okay, it's fine that it does not hold at least at this point, but can we fix that? So far, we didn't have any more parameters rather than having a temporary state. We didn't have any more parameters. So there are two ways to proceed in this direction. That's what we are doing. One is to get to a system where you have more parameters. And one is just to see whether with the temperature, can we have a uh, definition of a dental dual. So it would be like a charge with some temperature black hole is dual to charge with some another temperature black hole. Can we have this kind of duality? Uh, and of course, this is now near extremal, at least. Uh, non extremal is a bit far away, but at least in the near extremality. So, what is uh, happened? What happens is that you, this is the relation that we have kind of calculated earlier. Uh, the dependence on S0 turns out to be 2 by 3, uh, three by 2. Uh, this is the simply, uh, sorry, this is a simplified part. But uh, if you put, I mean, this is all when I put it, uh, all the values in, if you don't. Uh, then this is the def uh, dependence that you will get. Near extremal entropy is S0 plus some T dependent term S0 to the power three by two. Okay. So let's say you want to define this kind of thing, some fundamental duality, temperature dependent fundamental duality that we are defining. We are just saying that this is the general, uh, generalized fundamental duality. Uh, then you will get this thing, which is this F0 Q. Now what we have seen so far, we are still checking on this result that if you just assume that your T changes by very small parameter delta T, uh, for the next, uh, I mean, uh, under the duality. So what you can show is that uh, under the mapping like this, where if is a complicated function, I haven't put it uh, here. Uh, if you do that, uh, then you can still have a definition of fundamental duality, but then it's like matching from a charge and temperature black hole to another charge and temperature black hole, okay? And uh, the problem that we are facing in kind of that we have not problem or advantage, I don't know. At this point, we have uh, multiple uh, kind of solutions for FT. All of them are a bit complicated to check for even the reality conditions and all. Uh, we are uh, working towards it. And of course, there is another kind of approach or uh, the way we, uh, we are forward, you know, looking going forward is that, see, in this, in this case, at least, uh, what we have is a uh, constant modular scalar field. So we didn't have, don't have any uh, any extra parameter to play around. We cannot say it, any other thing that say that, okay, this thing, if that goes to there and the uh, normal fundamental duality transformation, then everything this kind of thing. We didn't have that. So <laughs> of course, uh, one thing is that going from away from this double extremal solution and go to a more, you know, quote unquote, realistic uh, version of uh, the duality. That's, that's what we're doing. And also another interesting approach is to do a gauge supergravity. So this thing, whatever we have done is an ungauge supergravity. In uh, gauge supergravity as well, you have extra parameters that it seems at least now uh, that we are working on that uh, you can tweak those parameters, those extra parameters that come and uh, get your uh, fundamental duality back. But now you have to, in some sense, put extra condition or, on how your gauge changes as well. Uh, in in the in the in the in the fundamental duality kind of scenario. So yeah, so that's that's all. So yeah, and thank you. Thank you for the talk. Yeah. So yeah, we are open for questions. Right. Maybe I should just ask one more question. Sure, sure, sure. Please. Thank you for your yes. talk. Um, yeah. So, should one uh, expect a Freudian duality for a system which is not extremal at all? I mean, is there any reason for it? Right. I mean, uh, in, in, in right. So, uh, this, uh, the one of the reasons I would say is that this, uh, if uh, I mean, the symplectic manifold that you still have in, in your charges. So, Freudian duality is basically. As, as, I, as I said, I mean, initially people have seen this duality through the symplectic manifold of the charges. They say that, okay, my symplectic manifold, I have some charges and they are like the elements of some Freudental triple system. So I, I don't see that if you go to a non-extremal scenario or at least in this case, why 
should that uh, why should that change or the question is that what happens to that parental triple system and of course now we have more results as well in some sense as i'm saying so and even if you go beyond that we have a duality if not parental we have a larger uh, duality the connection with if uh, its connection with parental triple system is yet to be explored i haven't uh, started working in that direction um, but yeah, it seems now, at least at this point, this should exist uh, some form of duality, this fundamental duality. Okay. Hmm. But of course, when the question that you are asking, when it's, it's a, of course, in some sense, uh, it shouldn't have. In I mean, if in, in in near extremal geometry as well, you could have said that it should not because once you are in near extremal, your supersymmetry and everything is gone. So uh, there is no uh, need of having a attractor kind of things or anything. So this should not even hold. Uh, I mean, this should depend on other parameters and all, but it seems that all the other parameters that may, that you will have in some way, uh, once you go beyond the extremality, they're all kind of packaged in the temperature itself. So in that sense, I think it should still hold once we have a more uh, generic definition which depends on temperature. So that would be a new definition of uh, Freudental, I mean, generalized definition of Freudental duality. And then one can prove what are that Freudental triple system involved in there. They have connection with Jordan algebra number theory and all. So probably there's something. Okay. And sorry for my Do we have uh, any more questions? No, it was fine. Yeah. Do we have any more questions? If not, let's thank the speaker. Thank you, Erga. Thank you for your time. Yeah. So, yeah, we'll meet next week. Yeah. 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 So thank you so much. Great. Yeah. Thank you. So okay. everyone yeah. we'll see you next week. Bye bye. Bye. Sure. Bye.